Hi guys, it's Angie with Fun Endeavors Tie-Dye Lab. Today I'm going to tie-dye a t-shirt that has a printed design on it. A friend of mine got a t-shirt at a youth camp this past summer and he thought it would look cool to go ahead and tie-dye the shirt. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm trying to protect the design in the middle of the front of the shirt, so I'm using a washable marker and drawing a circle around that area, just kind of to mark where it's at on the shirt. Then I want to isolate the front of the shirt. So I'm finding where the middle of the front of the shirt is, both at the top and at the bottom, and making a mark with a washable marker. Then I'm going to grab each of those marks, lift the shirt up off the table and give it a shake, and then lay it back down. So the side that's facing me is the front of the shirt, and the back of the shirt is what you see kind of back behind the sleeves. Like I said earlier, I want to protect the design on the front of this shirt, so I want to tie a sinew line around the outside of this design so that the dye doesn't come over into this area. To do that, I'm going to use a ruler and find the center of the design, then using a washable marker and a piece of kite string or sinew, I'm going to draw an arc or half of a circle around this design. Now I'm going to fan fold this line and I'm going to tie it with some sinew. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm using sinew because it's wax coated and it's not going to allow the dye to go underneath that area. Some of the dye may wick over into the area which is closer to the design, but I'm still going to have a white line there which is going to define that area a little bit. And that's what I want. I've also left a little bit of a buffer zone between the design and where I am fan folding the line. So if a little bit of the dye goes over into that area, it's not going to mess up the design. After I have this line tied, I'm going to go ahead and put one more sinew line just right on the outside. This is kind of an insurance policy. It's just a little extra buffer. You don't have to add the second sinew line. For me, I'm just doing it, like I said, kind of as an insurance policy so that hopefully not a whole lot of the dye is going to go over next to the printed design. From here, I'm going to lift the shirt up off of the table, let it fall naturally, and start tying sinew lines down the shirt. I'm not measuring the sinew lines, but you can if you want to. I'm just kind of eyeballing them and trying to get them close to the same distance between each one.
My friend requested a dark blue and dark purple, so I'm using indigo blue from Dharma and vintage purple from Dye Spin. He also would like to have some white left on the shirt, so I'm going to leave some of the sections white. I'm starting with indigo blue in the first full section right outside of the two sinew lines that I tied. I got part way into applying the indigo and decided I would go ahead and get a very small plastic zippered bag and wrap it around the portion that I don't want to get dye on. You'd be surprised how easy it is to get a little bit of dye on your hand and reach up and touch that portion and I didn't want to accidentally do that. So before I got too far into dyeing the shirt, I got a very small zippered bag, wrapped it around, and then taped it around this portion of the shirt. That's not going to keep the dye from wicking over into that area, but it will keep me from grabbing it or touching it or accidentally splattering a little bit of dye over there. Okay, so the pattern that I'm going to use is I'm going to skip a space after the indigo, then I'm going to do some vintage purple, another line of indigo right up next to it, and then I'm going to skip a space. And I'm going to continue that pattern down the shirt. I'm applying the dye to a damp shirt, and I know that some of the dye is going to creep over into the white space. So far it's doing pretty good and it's not wicking over there a whole lot, but it's going to happen. If you would like to kind of reduce the amount of wicking dye that's going to come over into the white space, you can add either just some plain water or you can add some thickened water. If you don't know how to make thickened water, I have a video out on my YouTube channel which shows how to make thickened chemical water. It's basically the same thing. You can just leave out the urea. Okay, I'm going to keep up this pattern and then I'm going to turn the shirt over and continue the pattern on the back side. Once I have the entire shirt dyed, I'm going to put it inside of a container that has a rack in it, like the one that I am dying over, except the rack is cut to fit down inside of the container. Then I'm going to put the lid on the container and put the shirt outside and allow it to process. I left the shirt for about 24 hours before I rinsed it. Okay, so here's what the shirt looks like just before I began rinsing. And you can see some of the dye has crept over into the white space, which like I said, I was totally expecting that to happen. The first thing that I'm gonna do is rinse the white spaces in cold water to rinse out the soda ash. 
Once the soda ash is out of those white areas, the likelihood of the dye bonding to those spaces is a lot lower. If you notice too, I have the center portion of the shirt or the part with the design on the shirt up and I am not putting that down in the bottom of the sink yet because I want to make sure I get it rinsed really well before it comes in contact with any of the dye that's getting rinsed out of the shirt. So if you don't understand some of the science of why we do what we do with tie dye, let me explain just a little bit and that'll make more sense to you. Procyon fiber reactive dye needs to have a higher pH and it needs to have heat to properly bond with the fabric. So the soda ash solution soak that you do before you start tie dyeing raises the pH. When I begin rinsing the shirt, I go ahead and try to rinse out the soda ash in cold water to get that soda ash out of there where I'm removing one of the elements that the dye needs to bond with the fabric. The other element that the dye needs is heat. And that's the reason why I rinse in cold water is because if I started rinsing in hot water and there was soda ash remaining in the shirt, and the dye was still active, it could potentially bond with the fabric. So I'm rinsing in cold water to rinse the soda ash out, and then I warm the water up to hot to try to rinse out any of the excess dye that didn't bond with the fabric. Hopefully that helps you understand why I begin rinsing in cold water, and then warm the water up to hot after I've rinsed in cold for a while. I continued rinsing in warm water or hot water until the water was running almost clear. If you don't keep rinsing until your water is running almost clear, then you're going to need to wash your shirt or whatever item you're rinsing several times in the washing machine to try to get out the excess dye. With this shirt, I went ahead and ran some really hot water in my utility sink, added a little splash of Blue Dawn dish detergent to the water, and I allowed the shirt to soak. You hear me talking about doing the soaking process? That's because the water may look like it's running clear, but if you soak the shirt in really hot water, you'd be surprised how much more dye actually comes out into the water. The reason for adding the Blue Dawn dish detergent to the water is Blue Dawn is a pH neutral dish soap, and adding it to the water just helps make sure if there is any little bit or small amounts of soda ash that is left in the shirt, the Blue Dawn is gonna help neutralize that pH and hopefully help it from rebonding onto the fabric someplace else. I know some tie dyers who actually boil water and put their shirts in boiling water to try to get out the excess dye. I try to get the sink water as hot as I can possibly get it. And the sink is right next to the hot water heater, so the water's pretty hot coming out of here. Soaking the shirts does a really good job at getting out the excess dye. And of course, if you've tie dyed very much, you'll know that there are certain colors that are just tougher to get rinsed out than others. And blue happens to be one of those. So I soak the shirt until the water cooled off. Then I rinse the shirt again and added some more hot water to my sink and continued the soaking process until the water in the sink was almost clear. Then I put the shirt into my washing machine and washed it on a hot water cycle using a little bit of Dharma's Professional Textile Detergent. You can also use Synthropol, which I've used Synthropol before. It's basically the same thing as the Dharma's Professional Textile Detergent. I just don't think that the Dharma's Professional Textile Detergent has as strong of a smell. So it's just a personal preference with me. I know some people use the Blue Dawn in their washing machine, but I prefer to use the textile detergent in my washer. Okay, so it's been washed, dried, and ironed, and this is what it looks like. What do you guys think? I like this design with this shirt. It's always a challenge to try to figure out how to keep an original design on the front of the shirt from being overtaken. And I think it worked out really well for this one. I like the blue and the purple together. I think they work really well together. 
And because I isolated the front of the shirt and tied it by itself, both the front and the back of the shirt look totally different. And I think that looks kind of cool. So if you guys have enjoyed watching me make this shirt, I sure would appreciate it if you would like the video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you all for watching and I hope you have a great day.